Hi, my name is Zohar. I'm uh, with Kaltura. Um, and this talk is about uh, how Kaltura uh, is basically a platform that packages up a lot of different open source components and a lot of different practices um, and, and some new components that we've uh, introduced ourselves in order to uh, simplify and unify, in, in order to simplify and unify um, uh, and provide a, a cohesive single platform to answer video uh, um, requirements for any type of video application. Um, so uh, we'll, it's, uh, we'll, prob we'll basically do a, a quick uh, what is Kaltura and then uh, we'll talk about the architecture um, and hopefully uh, do some demos and discussions. Um, <coughs> so the premise of why we, why we b started Kaltura at all is because online video uh, and video in general is actually very complex. Um, there's a lot of different requirements, there's a lot of different solutions, and it's very, very hard to scale. Um, so even the, 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 the very simple use case of just taking an FFmpeg and running it through 100,000 videos becomes a problem. And so how do you do it at scale, how do you do it reliably, um, and then how do you handle the, all the other stuff that is required in uh, distribution and so on. Um, so, so Kaltura was basically built to provide a platform to answer all those needs. Um, and basically uh, our approach was there needs to be a single server solution. Um, so uh, a one backend that is basically uh, exposed through APIs and then based on those APIs applications for different industries and different practices will build uh, customized solutions. So everything is always exposed through the same REST API. Um, and we'll see more about this in a sec. I don't know why it shows <laughs> the mailboxes here, but <laughs> those are supposed to be arrows. Uh, <laughs> <They're so rare. laughs> so uh, streaming video workflows, right? So again, go going back to the mission statement, right? Um, it's all about solving the, the scale problem with video. If you just have two videos or three videos, or if you want to do a home library, there's, there are enough solutions out there. Um, what Kaltura was set to solve is how do I do it at scale in a situation where, for example, if I'm a, a large broadcaster and I have a lot of VOD assets and a lot of live channels and I need to coordinate and manage all of them and, and create end user applications and collect the end user statistics, um, distribute video to all sorts of websites and so on and do it all uh, and manage it all in a sane way, um, then you basically end up doing a lot of different workflows. So how do you manage those workflows? And, and that's basically uh, uh, what we set out to do. Um, <coughs> in terms of uh, what are the design guidelines of the platform, um, open source, it's all uh, AGPL version 3. Uh, it's, uh, as, as a design guideline, the focus was around how do we solve problems that are scale problems. Um, so again, not like the two, three videos or a home library, but uh, you know, 10,000 videos or a distribution for a university or a distribution for an enterprise with you know, thousands of, of employees. Uh, generic, versatile, or in other words, b basically become the Swiss knife for video applications. So uh, one backend with a unified API that allows you to create applications that are cross industry, cross uh, use cases, without having to worry about the underlying, how do I manage FFmpeg? How do I work with this storage? How do I work with that uh, distribution API? Um, so again, API is first, and then uh, cross industry. So ev ever since the beginning, we actually focused on trying to solve multiple solutions at the same time. So we actually started off with education and media, then we expanded into enterprise and doing uh, uh, some more things around uh, others and, and real time today. Um, but the idea was basically, uh, at, at the core pr premise of, of Kaltura was basically the idea that, yes, video is complex, but even though the use cases and practices of how do you uh, take a video and, and experience it within the end user context would be different in terms of the experience, the back end of handling the video is actually the same. And so, um, how do we work with enough industries and enough uh, uh, end user types and converge those practices and use cases into one unified platform? Um, and the last thing was actually release frequently. So uh, we actually 
uh, Caltrain is being released on a bi-weekly basis, so basically every other Sunday there is uh, a new release uh, uh, up. <coughs> and uh, this is uh, uh, rather new, but uh, as we go more and more into live applications, how do we become more real-time um, and support uh, uh, problems like uh, real-time analysis of video and being able to collaborate between multiple cameras, for example, so use cases like that. <coughs> um, so in terms of the platform architecture, uh, uh, the core, which are basically the servers, so think about things that, uh, for example, running FFmpeg or the database and things like that, those are basically in the core. Everything is then wrapped through a uh, unified REST-based API. Um, we have uh, an automatic client libraries generator that basically runs automatically every time there's a new feature added or something like that. Um, and those generate client libraries in many different programming languages. So if you're writing an application, you can use a native application to your programming environment, um, but it's always kept up to date. Um, then on top of that, we have all sorts of uh, widgets. Uh, you've seen uh, earlier today the, the video player. There is uploaders and recorders. Um, <coughs> and then we've built applications on top of them, and there are many different applications, both from the community as well as our own. What's interesting is um, that the API approach is actually the same in the back end as it is in the front end. So just like applications are using the API to make calls to the server, for example, to access database records and things like that, the back end applications are doing the same. So uh, backend applications like batches, uh, which are asynchronous uh, systems that are running things like FFmpeg or email, are using the same API to actually access the database. There's no coupling between any component within the system, which basically allows for infinite uh, scaling and very agile uh, scalability. So <coughs> uh, what are the platform nodes? Uh, Basically, if we go back to the uh, slide uh, for the architecture, right? So what are the uh, servers that are running in the cluster? Uh, we have a load balancer, obviously. Uh, the front machines are the machines that are basically handling uh, the API layer the, and serving the applications, so players and things like that. Uh, batches are asynchronous systems that are basically running things like transcoding or notifications or email sending. Uh, Sphinx, which is a full text search uh, uh, indexing server, uh, it's an open source component. Uh, DWH, which is the analytics environment. Uh, it's basically used for log processing and database for both VOD and live. Um, and we're using multiple components here. Um, MySQL, or uh, what's the, the new that was replaced? MariaDB. And, or MariaDB. Um, Master and Slave, obviously, and then the NFS to handle uh, storage. And then uh, we also have solutions for uh, supporting other use cases. Uh, there's a, an interesting Nginx model, model that we recently released, um, and the media server, which does more real-time and live. Um, so other uh, open source projects we're using, uh, you, you've heard a lot about media info today. Uh, <laughs> FFmpeg, Mancoder, MP, MP4box, Sox, and actually a, a variety of also commercial encoders. Um, so we have integrations with all of them, and Kaltura is basically has a, uh, a layer in top of Cal ins inside of uh, the, the batch manager. There's basically the Kaltura decision layer, and we're basically managing those uh, transcoders in a way that, based on the information retrieved from media info, we know which encoder is better to use for what format and export, um, and how to Im uh, improve the the output of of each. Uh, and there's also kind of a waterfall fallback between them. Image magic to manipulate images. Uh, you know, a nice anecdote about this. Thumbnails in Kaltura are done in real time. So for example, um, if I need to get uh, a, f a specific frame from a video file, instead of uh, you know, having to pre-process the entire video file and then access only frames that I have uh, indexed, um, Kaltura will actually, on real time, will go into your source file and generate the thumbnail for you. And then you could also, in real time, do all sorts of manipulation, like you know, trim the, 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 the thumbnail or make it resize it and things like that. 
I um, mean, obviously, it's all cached, um, both under CDN as well as the server. Um, Nginx and the Nginx VOD module. So you've heard a lot about different problems, um, uh, like uh, how do I uh, take a video and chunk it and serve it as HLS, or how do I do HDS, or how do I do Dash? How do I do it in real time? How do I work with those formats and serve it correctly with every other uh, for every other system? Um, so, so this can become a, a big headache. Uh, we recently, uh, uh, Nginx we found is uh, very efficient in that, but it lacked a solution that actually knows how to do those things, how to repackage um, and how to uh, create those things. So we basically created and uh, recently released the Nginx VOD module. Um, there, there's a link at the end of the presentation which you can find. Uh, Red5 or any alternatives like Wowza, um, is uh, for live broadcast and webcam recording, uh, the Kaltura Pro library, which we talked about, and then all sorts of libraries that we use. Kaltura is mostly PHP based on the server side. Um, there's a bunch of other programming languages, but PHP is the core. Um, MySQL or MariaDB and Sphinx. Uh, Monit and uh, then for the DWH, like I mentioned before, we use a couple of uh, solutions, uh, Pentaho, Cassandra, and Sparks. Um, some notable references before we jump into a, a demo, um, if you want to, so essentially uh, if you want to get started and try out Kaltura, uh, to install it, there's a link over here, uh, we, we provide RPM and dev packages that will soon be uh, stable, I guess. Uh, using Chef, uh, we also have uh, recipes for Chef, and there's a, a, a live community, uh, you can get support on the forums or on GitHub. Uh, there's a knowledge center with tons of documentation. Uh, if you want to see the uh, nightly builds or bi-weekly builds, uh, status reports from the CI are there. And uh, if you want to play with the fun libraries over here, uh, you can do here. Another interesting design guideline while you set up is... Uh, I'm all set. You, wanna, you can start switching. But uh, Another interesting design guideline is um, whenever we work on a, another open source project like the Nginx module, for example, we actually try to build it in a way that is reusable outside of Caltra 2. So it will be uh, not just valuable for the community, the other community like with Nginx to the Nginx community, but also because it makes maintainability much easier with uh, a platform that is so big in terms of the different components that it leverages and the different solutions that it involves, um, you need to find a way to uh, segment things and make them easier to maintain by people who are outside of the platform community. So for example, the player library uh, was actually built in collaboration over the years with Mozilla and Google and, uh, it, and it's actually the player that runs inside Wikipedia. Um, and so a, bunch of all, a lot of our different uh, components, if you go into GitHub slash Kaltura, uh, you'll see all sorts of uh, projects there, and they all basically form the platform, but each project may actually be used on its own as well. All right, so this is Jess. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Jess. Thank you for joining us on this um, lovely sunny afternoon. Um, I'll be showing as much as the product as possible while uh, we have time. So as, as Zora mentioned before, Transcoding video is complex, and I think this screen shows part of that complexity. Because if you look at it, then this is the source entry that we got, and we need to transcode it to various flavors, and each of those are different parameters to FFmpeg or whatever transcoder we're using. Uh, so it's a pretty complex process. You can see here the warnings that we're getting per flavor. Uh, the reason why we need flavors, of course, is that we have various devices. So we optimize per device. The playback on iPad will not be the same as on my laptop or on a tablet or on an Android and so forth. So we utilize FFmpeg and the other uh, free party software that we're using in order to optimize the source video as best as possible per source to the end device. So what I'm showing here is basically what needs to get done for that to happen. That's our a big portion of our core product. Um, as far as we have 10 minutes, good. Um, as, as far as demoing, so let's talk a little bit about the Nginx model that we've just introduced. Uh, what it does is it's able to play, to create on the fly, 
manifests through Dash and HDS and various other formats so that they can be played. It's not directly tied to our platform, so it can be used independently. And there is an RPM package that you can install outside our platform. And of course, you can integrate it with Kultura's platform, which is, of course, the optimal solution. Because, uh, you know, we're the best and stuff. Um, so let's take a little entry here. Uh, this one's become quite famous. Everyone uses it to demo. It's that uh, bunny movie. I'm a bit scared of it myself, but I'll, I'll manage. Um, so this is currently playing HDS. Uh, and you know what? Let's put it on full screen so that will be, I guess, nicer. Okay, so, no, not this, sorry. So just to, to explain the integration with Nginx, uh, basically what we do is we have our server where the entry is saved or else it's saved on a CDN, probably a CDN. And what our player does is ask for a manifest. A manifest is just basically usually an XML, but it can be of other formats depending on the protocol you're using. Uh, and let me show it to you on the back end where things are simpler, at least for me. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, let's, let's view this. So currently I'm, I'm just making a call using CRL, which I guess everyone's familiar with, uh, to a specific asset that we have. Uh, Kultura's API is entirely RESTful. So you can see that the service name we're asking for here is play manifest, which is exactly what the player would do. Our player would say, okay, let's go to the server, what's my play manifest? And then it'll know where to play from. Uh, so let's just take a look at this. All right, so we can see here that it's an XML, as I said, and it's got a lot of metadata in it, and it's got the URL for the media, and what you can see here, as I said, there's one entry but a lot of flavor IDs, right, per device, optimized per device. So you can see here that this is my entry ID, like so. Yeah, I should have brought a mouse. And all these are sub-flavors of it, so that it can be optimized per device. So potentially, if I'm watching it on my laptop, I'll get this. You might get this on your iPad, and someone else will get some other flavor. And of course, it's very flexible, so you can adjust the flavors created as per your needs. So for instance, an organization might say, well, you know, I don't use iPads at all. Uh, all my employees are in, within my LAN, and they're all watching it on their desktops. No point for me to waste time producing these other flavors, so we can produce just the one. Uh, someone else may say, you know, I have very, very special needs for a very specific device, and I have my own transcoding expert. I just need you to give me the platform. I'll give the parameters myself. Fine, you can create, using our API or using GUI, you can create your own customized flavor if you know what you're doing. Uh, so that's basically the idea of it. We can see that it, the same entry, if I take this URL here that I've done in CRL, and I'll just put it on this dash player here that I happen to have uh, here. There you go. And I'll just uh, go like so. And so it plays from an external uh, player, right? From a JavaScript dash player. So you can see that it's just, it's the same exact URL. And what happens is that this will go to Kultura server. And for that particular profile, you'll say, okay, just a second. What profile are we asking? We're asking for MPEG dash, that's good. Let's see how we handle that specific um, serving profile. And then we'll go on to our database, we'll say, okay, for that we need to go to Nginx. Nginx is the one that knows how to serve this particular format. And then there'll be a relay call to Nginx, who'd actually be the one playing it. So this is the model that we have, this is what we based on Nginx. Uh, it's of course open sourced. It's made by a very bright man called uh, Aaron Kornblow, one of our own. And you're most welcome to look at it. I have five minutes, just so you know. I, I, wa I want everyone to know how much time we have. 
I don't wanna, you know. Um. Uh, also important to mention that the uh, the flavor is also for a dynamic refresh, which is adapted to the protein on that. Yep, that's quite correct. Um, another note that I wanted to mention while I was looking at this uh, presentation here is that you love effects, don't you? Yeah, it's automatic. <laughs> Okay, uh, as far as these nodes, I, I just want to clarify that our architecture allows you to segmentize your cluster any way you want it. So this is just a suggestion of, on how you should segment it, but you could have them all on one server. Of course, it wouldn't be redundant, but for development purposes, that's fine. Uh, you could decide that your Sphinx runs on the same machine as your analytics or whatever other combination you're comfortable with. So this is a mere suggestion. It makes sense to do it that way, but it's not a must. Uh, so I wanted to touch on that briefly. Uh, the last thing I want to show in my minute and a half that's left, I guess, is that, uh, as Zor mentioned, we have client libraries bindings for a lot of languages. Uh, let me just move to our CI system for a second. So our CI system actually has two parts. It does uh, some local tests on a cluster, much like the one on the presentation, the same spec of, as the one on, on the presentation. But it also integrates with Travis. Uh, anyone familiar with Travis CI? I hope so. It's a good tool. Should, if you're not, check it out. And whenever we push a new version, uh, it auto-builds uh, push, or whenever there's a pull request, it all builds the libraries for all these bindings. Uh, we have a few more, actually. We're in the process of integrating the rest of them. Uh, we have about 10 or 11 client libraries. So whenever something fails, you can see it, and it'll also be portrayed within that uh, CI and the repository for the thing. So for instance, if I go here uh, to our GitHub repository, mm. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay, so you can always see the current build status from here too. Uh, as far as our tests, we utilize the API. As, as Zora mentioned, our entire platform kind of utilizes itself when doing stuff because there is the API and the various components make API requests to them to the core. So essentially, anything that we can do internally, as far as our applications, can be done by an external person using that API. So pretty much all of it. Um, so that's important to note. And whenever we commit something, we run it through all the tests, uh, just to show how a log looks like. And then I'll uh, ask if anyone has any questions. So think about it now. Uh, anyways, it releases a lot of testing processes. And we have a lot of these uh, as far as bindings. Uh, let me just open that page just so you can get on quick glance at all the icons, I guess. And also, if, the, if we go back to the design guidelines, it's basically all meant to create an agile development environment where people are immediately can access every new release and can stay up to date. And the, the, the CI doesn't only build the client libraries, right after that we'll have a deployment system that basically pushes the client libraries to different repositories like npm and so on. Yeah, Ruby um, jams and uh, so, if you're so forth. And you're building a Pip. application, you can always stay up to date in the easiest way that is comfortable for you, rather than just for us as the platform users. And that's uh, I think one of one of the design guidelines that we care a lot about is is in terms of allowing agile development and being able to rapidly uh, evolve with the platform. Right. Uh, <coughs> so, any questions? I was that clear, was I? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing at all. Well, what? if you guys want to check it out, uh, come see us, or uh, just check it out on caltrail.com or uh, caltrail.org. Or grab a big run build. <laughs> or grab a very grand pip build, or do an RPM, or a dab build, or whatever. Yeah, uh, so just one note since nobody has questions. Um, we're always looking for volunteers, so we're very happy to get anyone. Uh, client libraries, we actually need someone to correct the Ruby tests, so <laughs> go.
volunteer. Uh, In our repository, love pull requests. <laughs> yes, we love pull requests. We love them so much that I made this ugly but very functional dashboard so that our guys can see what's going on and who's pulling and who's asking. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's you. It's you. <laughs> there you go, real time, guys. So, yeah, we love your pull requests and your issues when they're real. And uh, <laughs> have a good one.